Dear Father, we ask for the power of your spirit to open our minds so we can behold wonderful things from your truth. Your law is the teachings of the divine teacher. You are our God and we want to love and obey you with all of our hearts. And I pray that this class will be a part of our pilgrimage to love and serve you in Jesus name, amen. Now I'm gonna run through these real quickly. This is a lesson that I learned uh, when I was your age, I heard an old preacher say, Jonah forgot truths about God. And, and here they are. Number one, Jonah forgot that God is in control of every detail of his life. We often forget that. We think that, that what's happening to us is just happening to us. God is orchestrating every event in our life. With Jonah, God was orchestrating the ship in Tarshish, the sailors that were on the ship. He had him get on the ship that had the sailors that were concerned about knowing God. There were a lot of boats in, in um, Joppa going to Tarshish. That one was chosen by the Lord. Secondly, we forget God uses unusual circumstances. God used a storm, God used a fish, God used the sailors. I mean, how many people would throw you overboard? Not very many. And so God uses unusual circumstances in our life. For, for me, in, in my life, I've had many unusual things happen. I mean, that guy on the airplane pushing the buzzer is unusual. Um, taking Bibles into communist countries is unusual. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been put in jail um, in Albania, if you've ever heard of Albania. Um, you know, I, I worked at one of the largest Christian schools in the world of the time. I worked for... Uh, one of the more famous pastors in the world for a while. I mean, I've had a lot of unusual, but we forget God is using all those unusual circumstances and he wants to shape our lives. So for you and your ministry, what you have to tell people is God is using everything. Uh, my parents who didn't get along and fought, uh, their unhappy marriage, my sisters who both loved me and prayed for me and our missionaries now serving the Lord, my professors, all those things shape my life. Thirdly, this one is big. We often forget God knows more than we do. We see things like this from just this moment and our little short perspective. God is looking from above. Have you seen drone pictures of things that were familiar to you and they look so different from a drone view? That's the new thing. Uh, everything is being looked at by drones. And, and the movies they're making of nature from above is unbelievable. You know, how whales are and how, how wolves hunt, you know, the, the deer, everything. Even the glaciers, the volcano from above is so different. We're just starting to see that God always knows more than we do. And so what we're supposed to do is trust him. Now, do... Do all of you drive cars? Some of you drive cars. You drive, Jim, you drive, good. Anybody else drive? When you drive a car, usually you get a set of keys and permission to drive the car. Life is like driving a car. Surrendering to the Lord is like being driving along in your car and you pull the car over to the side, you put it in to park, if the shifter's here, or you put it into park, if it's down there, you turn the car off, you get out, you walk around to the Lord who's sitting in the front seat, and you say, you drive. See, surrendering your life is not asking the Lord to now and then give us advice which direction to turn. It's actually stopping what we're doing completely surrendering control, turning off all of our plans and directions, and giving the control to the Lord and letting him restart everything. See, that's the, the complete surrender of our lives is what Paul talked about in Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, not that you add the Lord to your life, but that you surrender by the, the, the daily dying to us running and controlling life. We 
surrender our bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifice means you die, but we stay alive. But dying means I lose control of the keys to my car and of the steering wheel. And I turn it over to the Lord. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Because he knows more than we do. And we forget that God always, now remember, the attributes of God I talked about yesterday, one of the attributes of God is called immutability. Now, wait a minute, I want you to think about something. If God is immutable, and God hated something in the Old Testament, has he changed? That answers the question of the whole gay issue that's going on around the world. What they say is, oh, homosexuality uh, was only a Jewish thing that God was opposed to. That's not, that's, that's just the Old Testament law. Wait a minute, if God hated something or was jealous about something, what does the doctrine of his changeless nature mean? He still hates it and he's still jealous. So God is always, because he's immutable, kinder, has more long suffering, and more merciful than us. You understand that? Me, I give up on people like that. I mean, if they aren't interested in the gospel, I move on. God, see, what happens is we're kind of like a group of people that go through life, and we're supposed to be sowing the word, sharing the gospel, but other people come behind us and water it. And it's God that makes it grow. And so what's really fun, and, and that's why uh, Bonnie is uh, part of her ministry, is she always carries around that camera and records everything. Because we find that there are a whole group of people we've never met that, well, I'll tell you about one, Singapore. Singapore is over here somewhere, isn't it? Isn't that kind of over by Malaysia or Indonesia? It's down here somewhere. Singapore is a British or used to be colony and it's very wealthy and there's a lot of money. When there's a lot of money, there's a lot of drugs and there's a lot of alcohol. And there is a Singapore drug rehab center that requires people that are checked in that they have to watch 1,000 hours of Christian something before they'll let them out. Because Singapore has all these laws, you know, they, they cane people and do all this stuff, and there's kind of a Christian background to Singapore somehow. Well, the, about 10 years ago, I got a note from a man named uh, Chi Sing Su. Chi Sing Su. I can't even say it. Chi Sing Su. And he said, he wrote me a letter. He said, I feel like I know you and your children and your wife, your wife that is an angel, you know, and the buddies. That's why I call my kids the buddies. And I thought, who is this guy? He said, I was in the drug rehab. I was forced to watch a thousand hours of something. He said, so I picked you. He said, I found your website. And he said, I watched 1,000 hours of you teaching the Bible. He said, I got saved at the drug rehab center. And he said, I have got my Bible marked up. He said, all the things you say, underline and mark. He said, and I just got released from the drug rehab center. And he said, I just wanted to say thank you. I thought, wow. See, we won't ever know. If he hadn't written me a letter, would I have ever known that the videos that are posted online, anybody even watches them? But the Lord sometimes allows us to have people find us, like the guy from the airplane found me, or like Chin Shi Shu wrote me a letter. I got a letter from China, from Western China, from a Chinese public school education director. And he said, sir, I thank you for website. You know, he doesn't have all the words there. I thank you for website. He said, you preach what is written on website. So if I listen and read, it's the same. I learn English on your website. He watches me teach, and I also post manuscripts, the outline. Only it's not just the outline, it's the words. And he watches and is following along, kind of like people learn English by watching movies, only he picked 
one where he had the transcript and he could follow and see how I pronounced the words. Later on, he sent me a letter and said, you, Christian. He figured that out by watching and listening. And so there is a Chinese government official in Western China that the Lord is sharing his truth with because of a group of volunteers that do all this. See, God is far kinder, long-suffering, and merciful than we are. The next things we forget is God is the one who gives good, perfect gifts, which are the comforts in life. Do you remember when God made the little plant grow and shade Jeremiah, or, uh, Jonah? That was a gift from God. The second thing is God can take anything away. We think just because we have good health, our, we can see, we can hear, whatever, we think that those are permanent. They're not. God can take anything away out of our life. Our parents, our husband, our wife, Ezekiel, we're not covering him. What did God do to Ezekiel? Do you remember? One day Ezekiel reported to God for work, and God said, today, you're what, when you walk home from work today and walk in the door of your house, your wife will die. Ezekiel's wife died because God killed her for a purpose. And do you remember what God told Ezekiel? He said, you can't cry, you can't tear your garments, you can't wail. Because he said, I am going to destroy Israel and Judah and send them to Babylon. And he says, I'm not going to be sorry because of their sin. And so you're going to be a picture of me. God can take anything in your life away whenever he wants to. And he's still just and righteous and loving and merciful and kind. And finally, we forget God only refines our lives to purify us to better love and serve him. All that Jonah went through was just for God to purify his life. Okay, there are seven episodes in Jonah, and I'm gonna, I have to finish Jonah because we have to go on to the next lesson where I'm behind. But Jonah's commissioned the pagan sailors. Jonah prays from the fish. Jonah learns compassion from God. Then he gets angry. Then, now you notice that there's this, this parallelism that is part of the structure of Jonah's life. Jonah commissions in flight, he's recommissioned. He witnesses to the pagan sailors, he preaches to the pagan Ninevites. He pray, prays gratefully, he prays angrily. Do you see how in Hebrew, it's built in what is called, a, a, in, in literature, it's called a chiastic or chiasm. This is C-H-I-A-S-M, is the English word for that type of a structure where, where it's kind of like parallelism that's building a message. The whole book of Jonah is a message from God. Uh, remember, Jonah is, is asked to go to Nineveh from up there by the Sea of Galilee from the very area that the Assyrians are going to come down and destroy all the way up to Bethel. And so always remember that Jonah was going to the people that were threatening his own people. So that's the book of Jonah. Let's do Haggai real fast. Haggai is famous. Uh, he is the post-exilic. The reason for this graphic is he's the prophet that told the people to go build the temple of the Lord. The major elements are that, that God is a God of sacrifice. He wants us, look at um, Haggai in your Bibles, and uh, I'm going to track and show you some of the great verses of Haggai. But look at chapter 1, verse 4, and this is something all of us should think about. Is this a time for you to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple lies in ruin? Is it time for you to buy the latest, newest iPhone while missionaries are suffering and don't have enough support? Is this the time for you to get a nicer and more comfortable house when there are people in ministry that don't even have a place? Do you understand the parallelisms? The people of Israel were more concerned about their private lives than God. And God says, that troubles me. Haggai began his ministry contemporary with Zechariah, the first of the post-exilic prophets, and there are only three. It's interesting, 
his ministry is dated. Did you notice that? Look, look in Haggai 1. In the second year, 1-1, one, one, of King Darius, the sixth month, the first day of the month. Did you know if you take the Hebrew calendar and overlay it with our calendar, that was August 29th, 520 BC. We know exactly when Darius was king. And we know what the second year and the da da da. It's, this is a fascinating book. It only covers August, September, October, November, and the first three weeks of December, the whole book. Why do we know that? It affects how you read the book. This didn't happen over a long period of time. He's saying, how come you're building your house and the temple's not built? You need to change your minds. And all of a sudden, the people responded. It's a picture that you can preach the word of God to a group of people that are carnal and disobedient, and they'll respond. And it's very exciting. So the whole structure of the book has a message. Haggai talks about the Messiah. Uh, Jesus, if you ever listen to some of the Christmas carols, one of them is, Come, thou long-desired Savior. Where does that come from? Jesus is called, and what is desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. This is, in Haggai 2, verse 7, one of those Old Testament prophecies of Christ. Christ is called the one who is desired by all nations. What does that mean? Everybody down deep wants what the guy pushing the button on the airplane wanted. He wanted hope and peace and wanted to know where he was going so he wouldn't go to hell like his maid told him. That is a deep desire in everybody's heart even though not all people once they find out it's Christ will respond. But down deep people want to know peace and joy and happiness. Um, there are some truths uh, in Haggai. Look at Haggai 2 starting in verse 6. And let me just show you some of the characteristics of God. In Haggai 2.6, thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven. God is Lord of the universe. Who else do you know that can tell you they're going to shake the heavens? Now, the Chinese seed the clouds. You know, they, they fly through airplanes and drop chemicals to make it rain. They can't shake the heavens. You understand? What Haggai is saying is that the Lord is the Lord of all the universe. Look at verse 7. I will shake all the nations. Who else can say that but the Lord? Only the Lord can say all. And only he can shake the nations. So the Lord is the one. Look at the next verse, verse 8. The silver is mine. Did you know the whole world right now is having a little problem because of Korea? Do you know what they're doing in Korea right now? I don't talk about North. South Korea is closing the cryptocurrencies. Have you guys heard of cryptocurrency? Bitcoin? Bitcoin? The Korean exchanges are huge in this new kind of money. It's money that's not connected to any country. It isn't US dollars, Japanese yen. It's computer money that's called cryptocurrency that you can use with no country tracking you. They can't charge you taxes on it. They don't know how much you have. It's computer money. And people use it for a lot of things. Cryptocurrency. Korea just shut down a, an exchange. The day they did it, 100 billion US dollars worth of value evaporated from that currency because of what Korea did. What does God say in verse 8? Don't worry about dollars or gold or silver. It's all mine. You know what the best way not to lose your money is? Surrender it to God. You don't have to give it away. Just tell him he's in charge of it. Because it belongs to him anyway. Okay, on to the next one. Look at what God expects. In Haggai 1.7, it says, Thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. It says the same thing in 9 and 14 and 2.4. God has expectations. Why do we read the Bible? To find out what God wants from us to do. Number three, the attributes of God. I gave you these verses. If you would like to take the time, each one of these passages describes one of the attributes of God. Rather than just buying a systematic theology and letting someone tell you all the answers, do you know what's really good? Find them yourself. 
find every time Jesus presents the gospel and the apostles, and when you're talking to someone that, that tells you, well, this is the only way that you lead someone to Christ, you say, have you ever read all the ways Jesus presented the gospel? Nine out of ten people you talk to in the ministry will say no. They bought a book on it. They bought a systematic theology. They bought their favorite author. Most people don't study for themselves. Do you know how to have the most confidence about any doctrine? Before you buy the book on it, read what the Bible says about it. Uh, when I read through the Bible each time, each time I look for only one thing. I read the whole Bible looking for only one thing. The first time I read the whole Bible, I looked for the names of God. And I took, I took a, a marker and starting in, in the beginning, God, and I marked God. And I marked every name of God and every title of God and every attribute of God from Genesis to Revelation. It took me 72 hours. And you know what? I instantly knew more about theology than most people. Did you know there are over 400 different names and titles and descriptions of God in the Bible? Different ones? He's called the rock, and he's called the strength of Israel, and he's called a consuming fire. He's also called the everlasting burnings. There are so many different descriptions of God that it's kind of like if there's a girl you like, you want to find everything about her, you collect pictures of her, you know, and everything she writes. Do we have that same hunger to know God? The next time I read the Bible through, number two, I studied prayer. I studied who prayed, what they prayed for, where they were when they prayed, how they prayed. I even found out that in the Old Testament, there are eight different English words, I mean, eight different Hebrew words, all translated by one English word. In other words, the word prayer in English there are eight different Hebrew words translating one English word. I feel robbed. God has a lot. Did you know the English word wait? You know that word? Wait? In Hebrew, there are eight different Hebrew words translated in the English Bible by wait. There is wait reverently, wait patiently, wait silently, wait expectantly, wait hopefully. God is really into waiting. We aren't. Most people don't like to wait. They just want to get it over with. Get it. Come on. Let's get there. God is into the journey and he wants you to wait. Then I found out in the New Testament there are seven different Greek words for prayer. It's fascinating. So here I do this words, I mean, I do prayer. I found out who prayed the longest prayer in the Bible. All of a sudden I found out what people prayed for in the Bible. They sure didn't pray for what I was praying for. You know what most people pray for? For good grades and a good job, you know, and to be well. That isn't even in the prayers of the New Testament. Do you know what the most prayed for thing in the New Testament is? Christian togetherness. Paul said, pray that I get to come to you and I want to spend time and I want to fellowship with you and nurture and learn from you. He prayed for that all the time. So I, I spent one whole month finding every name of God, 400 plus names. I spent one whole month finding, it only takes 72 hours to do this study because that's how long it takes to read the Bible. And I would read the Bible with a marker pen. And I was only looking for one thing. It's easy to read the Bible if you're only looking for one thing. And I highlighted and marked it and was going. The next time I went through, I read all the times there's anything about prophecy. Now that one was harder because it ended up I highlighted half the Bible, you know, because there's so much prophecy in there. So I got a new method because I kept wearing out highlighters. The next time I went through and, and studied, just like your dad, the sovereignty of God. Your dad inspired me. Uh, Steve Nichols has a Bible where he marked every time there's anything about the sovereignty of God. That he rules over all and does his will and all that. All that to say, 
you should study the attributes of God and find them yourself. Okay, remember message one, from verses one through 11 of chapter one, it's that completing the temple. And that event is a historic event that Haggai preached about. Message two is, he records the fact that the people, see God, th this is a sobering section of Haggai. God noted that his people responded to what he wanted and obeyed. Did you know what Malachi 3.16 says? That God has a book of remembrance. God is noting whether you do what he asks you to do. Did you know that means a lot to him? God can cause anything he wants to take place, but he wants us to choose to love and serve, obey and follow him. And so that's the whole middle message of Haggai. Uh, then Haggai gets into this future temple in chapter two, one to nine. There is a future temple that is promised. Then his fourth message is that your obeying me now causes my blessings to be on you later. Now, Haggai is all about faith. Remember that? And that's why in Haggai, the, the whole idea, the just shall live by faith, is profiled. Faith makes me obey, brings blessing. And that's his fourth. And then the final message of Haggai is that there's a future blessing promise. And, and I just want to show you this. Look at Haggai 2.20 and notice the repetition. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month saying, speak to Zerubbabel. Now look at verse 21. I will shake the heavens. Look at verse 22. I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms. Again, verse 22. I will destroy... And then again, I will overthrow. God is actively engaged in the future, which brings us, Goldian, are you ready? We're going to look at Micah and Habakkuk. I've already prayed. At the end of uh, uh, the last hour, we're going to do our quiz. There are the themes. You know them. Uh, the timeline the geography, all that stuff. I just am showing you this because I don't want you ever to forget. And, and as we look at Habakkuk, you should always think about where he is. Habakkuk is prophesying just before the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. Who was alive and listening to his message? These two guys. Did you ever think about that? How did Daniel get to be such a sharp guy? Daniel and Ezekiel are living under the ministries of Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah. And they are, I mean, they didn't read the book of Jeremiah, they heard it. They didn't read the book of Habakkuk, they, they were living it as it was taught. Remember, Habakkuk, again, is one of the southern kingdom uh, prophets. Habakkuk is right up in this time period. In fact, Habakkuk starts his prophecy during the same year Daniel gets carried off. You all know that Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem three times. He came in 605 BC and hauled off Daniel. In 597 BC, he came back and so he took Daniel, he took Ezekiel in 597, and then in 586, he said, I'm not hauling off anybody else, I'm just killing them all. And he just wiped out the city. And then took the surrounding people into captivity. So actually, this is the fall of Jerusalem, but it was preceded by Nebuchadnezzar would come and he'd knock down part of the wall and threaten them and take some captives and they wouldn't obey. So he came and knocked down more of the wall. And so during his first, during that first 
See, in 609, Nebuchadnezzar is coming toward Jerusalem. Four years later, he has battled him enough to knock down the wall and take Daniel. And Daniel gets four years. Do you admire Daniel? He was listening to Habakkuk. He was listening to Jeremiah. In fact, we know that Daniel studied Jeremiah for his Bible study. It says that in there. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's look at Micah. And the, the message of Micah is that God sees everything. And uh, the book is written showing God, only God could know what's written there. Uh, remember, Micah is down here in Jerusalem. And what he says is, God is watching you. He's, he's building evidence. And, and your day of standing in court answering to him is coming. That's the message. Um, you can divide the book of Micah around, it, it's, it's a twofold theme. There is a little comfort and a lot of warning. And there's a lot of warning and a little more comfort. And then the next section, there's no comfort. And then right in the middle is this really encouraging part. And then it's kind of encouraging and kind of judgment. And then it's bam. Do you look at this? Now, why am I even taking time to show you this? Did you know some people, when they come to your ministry, they only want this. They say, I just want positive stuff. Other people, this is all their ministries are. It's like every time you go to church, you feel beaten down and knocked out, you know? God shows us something. There should be a balance. A third of the book targets the sins of the people. A third looks at punishments to come. But a third has promises of hope. There must always be, when, when we are biblical in our ministry, we have to balance making sure we have regular words of comfort and hope, but never neglecting the words of warning and judgment. Balanced ministry. Micah 6, 8. So look in your Bibles. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah 6, 8. This is the high watermark of, of the... Old Testament talking about the character that God expects in us. What doth the Lord, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? What is mercy? Okay. Mercy, now in the New Testament, you all know that mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve, and grace is when he gives us what we don't deserve. But what's interesting is, in the Old Testament, mercy and loving kindness, loving whoop, kindness, is tied to something. This, this parallel word here, is the Hebrew word hesed. And hesed means God is merciful because he is lovingly loyal to his promises. So God, God wants us because of his promises, verse eight, to love mercy. And, and this time, mercy in English is actually the Hebrew word hesed, which is loving kindness. We should love the loyalty, um, the covenant vows we make to the Lord, and then to walk humbly. Now remember, Micah is contemporary with Hosea and Isaiah. Uh, they knew each other. Uh, Micah spoke to both the northern and the southern kingdoms. He, though he was directed to the south, he was speaking to both. And do you remember when we were talking about uh, the message of the prophets? He was against unjust seizure, poor spiritual leadership, corrupt business. I mean, he was targeting their lives. Now, some of the key verses, here's a famous one. This one's at the United Nations in New York. You know, all the world has a representative at the United Nations. This is in their building. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train anyone for war. That's the goal of the United Nations. What they don't realize is that that only comes when people respond to the Lord Almighty, to his word. So the United Nations selectively quotes a little bit from the Judeo-Christian world, but they don't want the Judeo-Christian God, right? That's part of the danger of world uh, politics. Uh, again, this I call the moral high watermark of the Old Testament. The Lord wants us to act justly, to love mercy, and boy does God love humility. God is drawn to humility. Even Ahab, do you remember Ahab? Who is Ahab's wife? Jezebel. Jezebel. I mean, that's even, if you want to be mean to some woman, say you're a Jezebel. That's a very negative term. That, that's used in literature of speaking. So Ahab was a wicked king. He was taking Israel into idolatry. God told him that he was going to die and the dogs were going to lick up his blood and were going to eat him. Remember? And he heard that message. And Ahab, inside of his house, put on sackcloth and began to walk around like this. Humbly, it says. He kind of said, God, could you not do that? I'm sorry. And it said, the Lord, the Lord said, look at Ahab. Wow. He's humbling himself. And the Lord delayed executing him. Even wicked people, if they'll humble themselves, God responds. Can you imagine what he'll do for us? Do you really practice humility? Humility is not thinking little of yourself. People do that all the time. They go, oh, I'm nothing. Don't pay attention to me. Don't look at me. What am I doing? I'm drawing attention to myself. It's not thinking little of yourself. It's not thinking of ourself at all, thinking of Christ. See, I don't care if you like you know, what I'm doing for the Lord. I care whether the Lord likes it. See, pride makes me wonder what you think of what I'm doing. Humility makes me wonder what God thinks. See, there's a whole different pride focuses me here. Humility focuses me here. And that, that is the message. The Lord wants us to walk focused on him, humbly with our God. Now, Micah, remember I said the positive? Who is a God like you who pardons sins? And then the ultimate future hope, you, Bethlehem, here comes Christ from you. See, Micah though he's filled with judgment, has lots of uh, future hope. Now, this is just a listing of all the prophecies of, of Jesus Christ that, that are in the prophets. Uh, here is Micah 5.2. Hosea talks about Jesus being in Egypt. Isaiah talks about Galilee and him being in Nazareth. Isaiah says that John the Baptist is going to come ahead of time. These are, are all of these Old Testament prophecies that I listed off for you. And uh, Zechariah said he'd come by triumphal entry. Smitten, Zechariah says, betrayed even the 30 pieces of silver. The Psalms tell us about what they did on the cross. The casting of lots is in Psalm 22. Uh, not a bone broken uh, comes from the Passover. The piercing of his side we already saw in Zechariah. Dying surrounded by the, the, uh, the criminals, even what he would say on the cross. Isaiah adds he'd be buried by a rich man. Jonah is a picture that he'd rise the third day. And then the destruction of Jerusalem, as Daniel said. But the real hope isn't just in the promises of Christ, but that when he came, he would forgive. And Micah reminds us that the God... You know how it says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, and Isaiah says, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. And then 
Isaiah says he throws him behind his back so he remembers them no more, as Jeremiah says. But look how Micah adds to that. God treads our sin underfoot and puts him in the depths of the sea. So he's not just talking about forgiving, saying forget about it. He's talking about forgiveness that, uh, that speaks of the great work of redemption. So Micah gives us a group of lessons. And uh, why, why does Micah look like that in the graphic? Did you guys catch when you read it how he prophesied? God sees. Hmm? God sees everything. As God sees everything, he also prophesied taking his clothes off. Did you catch that? To get the Israelites' attention, he went around the country in his underwear. And did you know, kind of like you're supposed to wear a class dress, I don't think that MVP would like it if you guys walked around in your underwear. I'm not sure God would like it either. But two men were called to do that. Ezekiel walked through the land, and he also cooked his food on cow manure. Isn't that unbelievable? The, the things God does to get our attention. Okay, what are some of these lessons? Number one, live the truth. Micah 3.11. Look what Micah says. They pronounce judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price. Doesn't that sound like Catholicism? You can hire the priest to do whatever you want. Did you know that, that uh, one of the past presidents, I don't know which one of the Philippines, their daughter has been married five times. Did you all know that? In a Catholic nation. The Catholic Church has annulled all of her marriages. She has children by five different men. One of the, the, the daughter, what, Aquino's daughter, has all these, because the Aquino family can pay the priests and they annul a marriage. Do you know what annul means? They say you were never married. Even though you have children, you're never married. You get to marry like you've never been married. That's going on to this day, what was going on there. Live the truth. Don't, now you say, why are you telling me that? If you guys go in the ministry, if you actually become word of life missionaries, some of you, you're gonna have supporters, people that give money to help you be in ministry. You want to know something really sad? People that give money will say, now, Jan Ray, I'm giving you this money, but this is what I want you to do. And what it is is they have strings attached to the money. When I was a pastor, I had people say, I will give a million dollars to build that building, but you have to name it after. See, they didn't give it to the Lord. They did it to be a monument. Always, we have to guard against doing for money. We live the truth. We can't be bought. Look to Jesus. Micah points to Jesus. He is the, the poor and the oppressed and the misfortunate, he said, have the breaker. That's the one that breaks their bondage. He's talking about looking forward, even though you are poor and oppressed, that there is someone coming that will liberate you. So he talks about living for Christ. Thirdly, he talks about paradise is returning. That's Micah uh, 4, 1 through 8. And finally, the verse I've already mentioned, God has expectations. So that's the book of Micah uh, written from God's perspective. Now, Habakkuk, God desires our faith. Now remember, this, this is fascinating. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Does anybody know? Hmm? Yeah, Hebrews. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? We don't know, do we? It's been disputed throughout all of history. But let me show you something very interesting. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Romans tells us who's justified. And Romans quotes Habakkuk 2.4. Who, when the just, how do they live by faith? without works. Galatians explains it's not by works. Quotes Habakkuk 2.4. Hebrews quotes Habakkuk 2.4 and defines what it means to live by faith. 
One of the things that ancient scholars believed is that it's possible, the Apostle Paul wrote it anonymously, and left that little, there are only three New Testament books that quote from Habakkuk 2, and those three New Testament books show who the just are, how they live, and what faith looks like. Isn't that interesting? That's just an idea. Uh, basically, um, Habakkuk is saying, watch out Jerusalem, Babylon is coming. And uh, that's the message of Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk talks about the sovereignty of God. Uh, look at chapter three, Zephaniah, Haggai, there it is. I love this verse. This is probably one of my most marked up uh, you know, verses in Habakkuk. Just a second. Chapter 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom or any fruit on the vine, though the labor of the olives may fail, though my fields have no food, verse 18. I will still rejoice in the Lord. Habakkuk tells us that the source of joy and happiness comes from Christ alone. And I love that. Uh, Habakkuk uh, doesn't address the people, but basically Habakkuk is written differently. It's Habakkuk struggling with God. And, and it's almost us listening into a conversation. Uh, Habakkuk is troubled. He says, he says, how come we're, we're crying out to you and you aren't doing anything? How come uh, I'm, I'm complaining to you and you're not responding? Habakkuk was troubled and the Lord responds. God says, look at the nations. The earth someday will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. The Lord is in his temple, stop complaining. See, it's, Habakkuk is really a, a fun book to, to uh, spend our lives reading. And then this I already quoted. This is the, the high watermark of faith. You trust the Lord even when you don't have anything visible. Um, if you're in the ministry many times, this will happen in your life. That you will come to a place where there's no one that can help you but the Lord. It's like living by faith. Kind of like George Mueller. Have you all heard of George Mueller, the orphan guy who prayed and the Lord sent the money? And we're only two slides away from finishing Habakkuk.